Hello and welcome to another episode of the Breachside Broadcast, home of the finest voxcasting either side of the breach. On tonight's episode, we have the conclusion of Waking Nightmare. Lilith has sought out help from Zoraida the Swamp Hag, and Dreamer has made an unexpected appearance. Together, they hope to defeat Nakima and Titania. I hope you enjoy the conclusion of this story, right after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Breachside Broadcast is brought to you by Lord Chumney's Cricket Bats. Our bats are made from the finest earthside ash and imported directly to Malifaux from Buckinghamshire. They're a great gift for any little boy who suffers from nightmares. With a trusty cricket bat by his bedside, he'll be able to fight off even the most hideous monsters under his bed with ease. The midnight hour had come by the time Zoraida led the dreamer and Lilith out of her hut. Do you remember your part? Zoraida asked the dreamer. Yeah, yeah, he griped. We only went over it a hundred times. Lilith sighed and rubbed at her temples with one hand. Dealing with the boy was exhausting. Meet me at the broodstone once I gather my children. She looked down at the obnoxious human. From there we'll travel to Arrowfall Cliffs together. If we ambush Nakima's forces when they make camp, they will be too tired to contend with us. No matter what, eh, Titania? She blinked as the boy rolled his eyes and simply disappeared. Annoying little roach, Lilith muttered. She glanced back to Zoraida. Can we trust him? Zoraida didn't immediately answer. Instead, she took a bag of knuckle bones from a pouch at her hip, shook them, and cast them onto the porch of her hut. Whatever answer she gleaned, it only deepened her frown. Zoraida, Lilith said after a moment had passed, drawing the swamp hag's attention. You've been distracted ever since you showed up. What's going on? Zoraida shook her head and scooped up the knuckle bones. Forgive me, but I have a great deal on my mind as of late. The augury is strange but favorable. The boy is being manipulated by nightmare. But for the moment, at least, our goals align. Lilith acknowledged that with a nod. Will you meet me at the cliffs? I will be there, Zoraida said. She rubbed her hands together, drawing out the power to spur a change. Her form shriveled and darkened, taking on the form of a fat black crow. It cawed once and took flight, breaking through the bio canopy with ease as it disappeared. Lilith sighed. Something about the dreamer's appearance and her auguries had put Zoraida on edge, and that, in turn, put Lilith on edge. Unfortunately, it couldn't be helped. She placed her hand on a nearby tree, using it as a focus to send her awareness out through the tree, into its roots, and through the ground, through the myriad forms of life that lurked in the wilderness, searching for her home with the broodstone. When she sensed her spirit was in the right area, she allowed her search to broaden, seeking out an animal for the transposition. Her spirit quickly brushed against one, an arachnid predator of some sort. She was about to complete her spell when fear rushed through her, originating from the animal. It was an unusual reaction to her touch. Lilith wondered if it might have something to do with her wound. No matter. She redoubled her effort, drawing the creature's attention to her. Appealing to its instinct, Appealing to its instincts, she offered to exchange places, and its primitive mind agreed instantly. 
she felt her body dematerialize and rush through the ether, pulled through the emptiness, before it emerged in the spot the spider had occupied. The world was an inferno of fire, screams, and ringing steel. Before Lilith could orient herself, something big and heavy collided with her, knocking her off her feet. She rolled onto her hands and knees when another object fell upon her. Cursing, she shoved it aside, drew her blade, and tried to orient herself. Her attacker was a Nephilim corpse. Black blood sizzled out of a hole in its chest. A glimpse at its brands revealed its identity. It was one of her children. Shock dawned on her, and she turned her gaze toward the chaos erupting in all directions. The broodstone was under attack. Nakima had already arrived. All around her, Lilith saw her followers, her children, fighting a pitched battle against Nakima's forces. Black blood flowed in freshly formed rivers, and hooves churned the trampled ground into toxic mud. Blades, claws, and teeth clashed as the air flared with deadly spells. Lilith even heard the boom of human-forged firearms adding to the din. No, she cried, full of disgust and rage. She rushed in, targeting the closest Nephilim who wore the brands of Nakima's tribe and lopped his head from his neck. A pair of juveniles rushed her, claws leading, and she cleaved them both down with one blow. <clears throat> Barbaros, Lilith shouted, repeating the call as she hacked her way through the traitorous Nephilim. Mistress! Barbaros Raspi Cry finally answered. Lilith spotted his armored form hacking his way to her with his barbed sword, and she began cutting her own path until they were joined in the heat of battle. Nakima has come, he hissed. She fell upon us without warning. Damn her worthless hide, Lilith snarled. Flee, he said. This fight is lost. I will spend my life to cover your retreat. I will not run. She impaled the charging Nephilim adult with her sword wrenching it free to leave his torso hanging lopsided and spineless from his waist. Hot black blood splashed her face, and she felt a searing heat burning in her chest. The battle rage fell upon her, bringing the world around her into stark focus. She felt young again, like she was claiming her first kill, before she'd contorted her form to its human shape. Lilith threw her head back and let out a scream of joy. The sound reverberated through her followers, their howls joining hers and filling them with renewed resolve. Like a changing tide, Lilith's Nephilim surged forward with their mother at the forefront. Great sword swinging in a wide arc, she carved into a wave of Nakima's minions. They were tougher and stronger than the banished of the seas, but they fell before her blade just the same. Whenever they came for her in groups, she faded away, appearing behind them and bringing a quick end to their wasted lives. Lilith's Nephilim fell in at her side, from the smallest tots to the oldest warriors, all clamoring for the blood of Nakima's misbegotten horde. Their countercharge was bolstered by Lilith's shamans, who carved the black beating hearts from their foes and offered them up as catalysts for their dark magic. Swells of power rippled through the Nephilim, strengthening their muscles with each fell word that fell from the caster's masked lips. Many of the smallest Nephilim twisted and swelled as the magic enveloped them, their wings spreading as they became young adults in a matter of seconds, and they shrieked with agony as they took wing for the first time, falling on their enemies as a horde. Each wave of transformations broke Lilith's heart. They were not yet ready for their new forms, had been pushed into them by the twisted magics of the shamans, but it was necessary. Better to be forced into a stunted adulthood than to perish at the claws of Nakima's children. Those that hadn't grown surged up from below, a swarm of baby-faced monsters with jagged metal claws strapped to their wrists and ripped down packs of half-human blood wretches who had nothing but malformed claws, swords, and the occasional human firearm to fight Lilith's brood. Above her came her cherub, black pinions beating furiously as it fired arrows from its tiny bow. Bolts struck between shoulders and through vulnerable necks, knocking them aside and distracting them with magical bliss. The enchanted fools were pulled down by the youngest Nephilim almost as quickly as the cherub could fire. A roaring, horned adult broke from Nakima's ranks to charge Lilith directly, but Barbaros intercepted it. His stunted wings tucked up against his back as he dove forward, hacking the much bigger warrior's knee with his barbed sword. The monster buckled and fell, its roar turning into a scream of pain as Barbaros sawed his blade along the joint and tore the limb free from the rest of its muscled body. 
It lashed out at him with its claws, but Barbaros turned into the blow, allowing his armor to absorb the worst of the counterattack. Lilith leapt onto the mature Nephilim's toppled body and planted her blade in its spine. Before she could let loose another war cry, a bullet ricocheted off her greatsword, dangerously close to her chest. She yanked the sword from the corpse beneath her and dove back into the mass of combat, her eyes darting back and forth in search of the shooter. She spotted a whirling duster coat in the barrel of a rifle just before the muzzle flashed. Lilith ducked, her preternatural speed saving her, but the Nephilim behind her was not so lucky, and his head burst like ripe fruit. Lilith glared at the shooter, who leered back, her smile evident even through the black kerchief she used to cover her face. Angel eyes. Snarling, Lilith summoned forth a tangle of vines that burst from the earth and ensnared the half-Nephilim abomination. Angel eyes dropped her rifle and clawed at the vines with her black claws, muttering obscenities. Lilith used the opportunity to close in on the hybrid. Nikima must truly be weak if she's allowing you half-breeds to fight alongside her, Lilith snarled. Angel eyes continued to struggle, but her voice was coolly detached. She understands the value of innovation. You and your brood are still rubbing sticks together in the darkness. And here I didn't think I would be able to kill any humans today. Lilith raised her greatsword. With a flash of speed, Angel Eyes drew a revolver from its holster. She fired from the hip, her limbs tangled, but Lilith still had to dance aside to avoid it. Before she could counter, a swarm of hybrid blood wretches raced forward to protect their leader. Most of them tore at the vines attacking Angel Eyes, but a few brave or brainless ones slashed at Lilith with their malformed claws. She hacked them down, and Angel Eyes used the distraction to break free and escape into the churning battle. Coward! Lilith shouted after her. Mistress! Barbaros called. She found him pointing toward the west. More come! Lilith cursed. Close ranks! To me! The command echoed down through her Nephilim, who gathered up to meet the second wave. As they regrouped, she could see Nakima's reinforcements emerging from the forest, their eyes filled with bloodlust as they took in the scent of the battle. Lilith didn't wait for them to gather on open ground. She let out a war cry and charged, her followers at her sides. A heartbeat before she sensed the trap, something landed on the ground at her feet. Lilith had the sharpness of reflex to identify it as a stick of dynamite, its fuse sizzling down to nothing. She threw herself backward a mere moment before the explosive went off. The shockwave hit Lilith and sent her hurling several dozen feet. She tucked and rolled as she hit the ground, sparing herself the worst of the landing, but the blast stunned her nonetheless. For several moments, she felt and heard nothing, and her vision refused to focus. As she fought down the urge to fall unconscious, she saw herself gazing into the startled expressions of her dead followers, the intact parts of their faces stretched in expressions of shock. The ringing in her ears faded somewhat, adding screams of confusion and pain to the mix. From the forest, Nakima's children threw human explosives into the center of her ranks, and the effect was devastating. Her warriors scattered to avoid the destruction, and those that didn't were torn apart by the blasts. When the confusion was greatest, Nakima's warriors burst from the tree line, joining those already engaged with Lilith's forces, closing the pincer. Barbaros was at her side in an instant, hauling her to her feet. She gave her head a shake, glad at least that she was no worse for wear. We're routed, he said. You must flee. No. She shoved him aside and shouted up into the air. Dreamer, show yourself. Wow. The dreamer melted out of the air next to her, landing on a fallen Nephilim. Grinning and popping bubblegum, he hopped from one corpse to the next like stones on a river, avoiding the toxic black blood that muddied the grass. So this is why you're late, dreamer said, flashing a cocky grin at her. I was waiting forever. You dare, Barbaros growled. Lilith waved him off. We need your aid, she begged. Without my forces, Nakima and Titania will be unstoppable. Yeah, yeah. Dreamer cast aside her concerns. He spat out his gum. Come on, Mr. Chomps. Let's play. 
He skipped over the bodies like playing a game of hopscotch, leaving tiny bootprints on Lilith's children and enemies alike. Where he stepped, the mud festers and bubbled. Wide-eyed creatures, almost a mockery of a teratot in shape, emerged. The summoned nightmares quickly fell in behind the dreamer, watching the battle with the same excitement as their creator. The Nephilim surrounding the dreamer slowly took notice of his presence. Brief exchanges of confusion rippled through their ranks before one of Nakima's followers roared in challenge and took wing, coming down at the boy, leading with its claws. The dreamer grinned, wound up his cricket bat, and swung. Before either the dreamer or the flying Nephilim could connect, something big and blue lashed out from seemingly nowhere and hit the swooping Nephilim like a speeding train. Its broken body careened through the air and slammed into one of its fellows, tangling them in shattered limbs. From thin air, four muscular arms reached outward, grasped the bloodstained ground, and pulled. A body that would have towered over even Nakima emerged, drawing itself up and over the combatants. What is it? Barbaros uttered, his eyes wide in horror. The dreamer smiled back at him as he evaporated into nothing, his Cheshire grin the last thing to vanish. The boy's voice echoed across the battlefield. And now we get to really have some fun. Lord Chompybits roared, the sound momentarily drowning out the battle. Then it charged forward, its clawed limbs thrashing and horns goring. A dozen Nephilim fell within a few heartbeats, and Lilith had just enough time to wonder whether the dreamer's pet even cared which side it was cutting down. A shriek echoed from the north, distracting her from the sight. Bat-like wings carried Nakima over the battlefield, and she landed before Lilith with her sword drawn. Sister, Nakima hissed, a cruel smile on her face. You're late, and you're early. Nakima's grin curled tight on her lips. Surprised? No, Lilith answered. I've waited a century for this moment. It's about time I cut you down once and for all. Nakima growled, stretching to her full height to tower over Lilith. They both readied their blades, staring at one another in patient anticipation. Nakima was the first to let loose, and with a war cry she hurled herself at Lilith hammering down on her smaller sister with unrestrained fury. Tell me, what was it like to surrender your true self for that meek human form? It has its advantages, Lilith hissed, diving and rolling past Nakima's wide, arching swings. Nakima was tall and powerful, but she had to position herself more carefully to keep herself balanced. Lilith used her size as an advantage, ducking and fading away from incoming blows as she darted around her sister. In a voracious and desperate swing, Nakima caught Lilith off guard and their blades met. Lilith's feet slid back into the mud as her sister pushed her down, laughing wildly. Go, Lilith shouted over the sound of grinding steel to Barbaros. Regroup the others. Tell them to stay out the dreamer's way. Barbaros hesitated and then rushed off, following in Lord Chompybit's corpse-strewn wake. You don't have anyone left to fight for you, Nakima taunted. Your brood will die here and my children will sup upon their flesh. I'm not dead yet, Lilith growled through clenched teeth. Her feet were slipping away beneath her as Nakima steadily forced her lower and lower. So long as I'm alive, you'll never have what's mine. Nakima roared. The throne was and is mine. You are nothing but a usurper, struggling to cling to what you stole. You would lead us all to ruin, Lilith shouted back. Reckless, impatient. Now, like then, you blind yourself to any problem that cannot be solved with brute strength. I will not be denied. Nakima pulled back and brought her sword down in a brutal overhead strike. Lilith raised her blade to block it, and Nakima's sword struck her blade so hard that it sent a jolt of pain through Lilith's arms. She stumbled back, and Nakima took advantage of the opening to grab her by the neck, hauling her off her feet. Don't pretend that you care for our kind sister. You spin your stories of the great evils that threaten, of the tyrant's return. Nothing but fear-mongering. The same words today as a century past. You simply wanted the throne for yourself, and look at what it has brought. Lilith pulled at Nakima's grasp, 
but the larger sister had the greater strength. I grew sick of your indulgences. The tyrants are returning. If you think you will be safe under Titania's wing, then you are an even greater fool than I thought. Nakima balked, surprised. Lilith used the opportunity to swing her greatsword one-handed over her head. The attack was clumsy and obvious, but Nakima took the bait just the same. She dropped Lilith to parry the attack, and when she hit the ground, Lilith rolled under her sister's legs, slashing at Nakima's wings. Nakima responded by taking flight, landing two dozen feet away. Lilith used the reprieve to get to her feet and catch her breath. Did you think you'd keep your little alliance a secret from me? Lilith asked. You are never subtle, sister. Nakima frowned, but it twisted into a smile. Subtle enough to catch you off guard here. They both took a moment to exhale slowly and fall back into fighting postures. There was a pressure in the air, like a coming storm, and the sounds of the battle around them faded into the background. Loth wondered if this was what Zoraida would have called fate. The throne is mine, Nikima growled with ringing finality. The Nephilim are mine. Lilith licked her lips. You sold your kinder to Tanya, Nikima. You've traded your throne to bow at hers. No more words, sister, Nikima said. No more, Lilith agreed. They charged at the same instant, their blades crashing with a boom of thunder. Zoraida's wings carried her quickly through the air, but she could tell something was wrong from the moment she dipped below the forest's canopy. As she swooped down for a better view, the towering form of Nightmare appeared, seemingly out of nowhere, and swiped at an adult Nephilim, its claws tearing through the creature like machetes. It wasn't paying attention to her small form, and Zoraida was forced to veer violently to one side to avoid being killed by its claws. Her correction sent her careening through the air in a clumsy dive, and she smashed through a gauntlet of tree branches and landed with a heavy thud on the grass. Focusing through the pain, she crawled along the ground, warping into her human form as she went. She pulled herself to her feet and looked around with wide-eyed horror. She hadn't seen any of this, not so much as a glimmer of this slaughter in her auguries. How could her visions have led her so astray? A glint caught her eye through the blood-tainted forest, a flicker of red pinions reflecting the lights of a fire. A figure stood just inside a copse of trees, well outside of the notice of the Nephilim. Empty, bleeding eyes stared back at Zoraida. Titania, the Autumn Queen, smiled sweetly. With an almost apologetic shrug, she held up a still-beating heart, pierced with three iron nails. The heart of a liar, pinned with three truths. Zoraida felt her veins ice over. It was a spell that concealed the future with a false image. A spell that, until that moment, Zoraida had believed that only she knew. Titania tucked the heart away, waved her fingers at Zoraida, and disappeared into the forest. Then Lilith screamed from the other direction. Lilith dodged Nakima's slash by a hair's breadth, and tried to duck out of her sister's reach. Nakima wouldn't allow it, and her long legs carried her forward faster than Lilith could retreat. Rested and fresh, Lilith could have counted on her body, but the wound at her side ached and throbbed. With every movement, she felt the blood running free from under the corset, spilling down her leg. Whenever she tried to vanish, it only bought her a second of respite before Nikima was on her again, battering aside any Nephilim foolish enough to come between them. Wobbling, she deflected Nikima's blade and slashed her sister's hip open. Nikima roared, batted the blade aside, and headbutted Lilith, causing the world to erupt into pain and light. Lilith staggered backwards and before she could recover, Nikima plunged her blade into her sister's chest. The blade ripped out from Lilith's back, just beside her spine, and not far from her previous wound. Lilith threw back her head and screamed in pain. No! Zoraida scrambled forward, her ancient body protesting in every joint. Lilith had collapsed to the ground at her sister's feet, her black blood pouring out of a massive wound in her chest. Nakima was raising her sword, 
preparing to decapitate Lilith and end their rivalry once and for all. Zoraida hissed at Nakima and gestured towards her eyes, her fingers twisting into a hex. Nakima reeled back as if struck, one hand reaching up to cover her blinded eyes as the other swung her sword about wildly in an attempt to cut Zoraida down. Stay out of this, witch. Nightmare! Zoraida desperately yelled. To me! There was a roar from Lord Chompybits that echoed through the forest, and the next moment the beast was beside her and slamming into Nakima, knocking her backwards and through two trees. Blinded and wounded, Nakima retreated as quickly as she could, her wings lifting her awkwardly through the forest canopy and out of sight as Lord Chompybits lunged at her legs. As Nakima fled, the enormous beast roared one last time before it faded from view. In the same moment, the dreamer flashed into existence beside Lilith and Zoraida, his eyes locked on the mortal wound in Lilith's chest. Whoa. Get us out of here, Zoraida cried. The dreamer blinked, his face paling. He grabbed them both, Lilith's weakened and pale fingers in one hand, and Zoraida's gnarled and wrinkly fingers in the other and plucked them out from the battlefield. Zoraida felt herself being pulled through the realm of nightmares, a realm of unending blacks and purples punctuated by bursts of relentless fear, and a moment later they were back in her shack. Soul stones! Finally free of the battle, Zoraida motioned toward one of her cupboards. Bring them here! Too distracted to properly mimic walking, the dreamer simply floated through the air to the cupboards, and opened them to peer inside the stockpile of soul stones. He opened his mouth to say something, but then a familiar voice whispered in his ear, and his lips pulled back in a devious grin. He waved his hands in front of the glowing gems, scattering them far across the swamp like Lord Chompybits had suggested. When he turned around, his expression was the perfect mask of confusion. All I see up here are cobwebs and spiders. What? The rider rushed to the cupboard, stared at the emptiness inside, and cursed. Titania again! Snatching up a bundle of cloth and a needle and thread, she fell upon Lilith. Her mind raced in a thousand different directions as she examined Lilith, frantic for an answer to an unsolvable problem. She snatched up a length of cloth to make a bandage, only to pull her fingers back in pain, burned by Lilith's blood. Is she going to die? The dreamer watched Lilith with detached curiosity. Every so often, the ghost of a smile tugged at his lips. Zoraida cast a venomous glare in his direction. What do you think I'm trying to stop, you stupid child? The dreamer scrunched up his face, placed his hands on his hips, and silently mimed her words in a mocking manner. Lilith wheezed, coughed up more black blood, and raised her hand trying to wave Zoraida away with the last of her strength. There wasn't any way she could possibly... Wait. Zoraida's eyes darted back and forth, the beginnings of a solution forming in her mind. A terrible truth dawned on her, and fear ran down Zoraida's back like cold sweat. I know a way, she said. Her voice sounded oddly flat in her own ears. The dreamer could feel Nightmare's surprise, and his eyes sparkled with excitement as the game took an unexpected turn. Yeah? How? Lilith could barely think, let alone breathe. She drifted in and out of consciousness. At one point she thought they were in Zoraida's hut, but they were somewhere else now. With what little energy she had left, Lilith forced her eyes to stay open refusing to blink away the dim light of pre-dawn. The sun had not yet risen, but in the gloom she understood where Zoraida had taken her. Zoraida and the dreamer stood on the upper floor of Nythera. Before them, stretched and yawning like the maw of some impossible beast, was the black abyss that had once kept Titania and her loyal court as prisoners. Will it work? Dreamer asked, staring into the pit. It will. I just wish there was another way. Lilith tried to move, but her body offered little more than a shudder. She looked up to find herself in the arms of Nightmare, 
the four-armed monster that the dreamer had dubbed Lord Chompy Bits. She could feel her corrosive blood oozing out onto the creature's muscled arms. But strangely, it didn't seem to be affecting him. What? What way? she murmured, her voice little more than a whisper. Zoraida turned. Lilith. She struggled to sit up, but Nightmare stilled her with a heavy claw against her chest. What are you doing to me? The swamp hag sighed, her shoulders heavy. Nathira was designed to keep Titania alive. It drew on the life of this forest and eventually turned it into the Badlands. Lilith felt a rush of panic. No, no. She forced herself free of Nightmare's grip and stumbled to her feet, only to collapse to one knee as pain flared through her body. Glistening black blood poured from her wound, and her face contorted in pain as she hissed through clenched teeth. You can't. Lilith, Zoraida pleaded. Hear me. The fate I have seen. The only future where the tyrants can be defeated. The only future where we have any chance of survival is one in which you live. I won't become like her, Lilith said. I would rather die than become a... Lilith clumsily backed away, only to bump into a wall of nightmarish flesh. She tried to turn, but Nightmare grasped her in all four of his arms and lifted her up the way a man might examine a mouse in a trap, effortlessly dangling her in front of him. Zoraida bowed her head. We all have to make sacrifices, Lilith. She turned away, unable to watch. Nightmare carried Lilith to the edge of the abyss and swiveled her legs so that she faced him, his monstrous face twisting into something reminiscent of a smile. Lilith froze. In that moment, she saw the dreamer's pet monster for what it truly was. She had always known that Lord Chompybits was not just the dreamer's plaything, that it was a creature known as Nightmare, and that Nightmare had existed far longer than the boy suspected. Until that moment, however, it had shielded itself in illusion, hidden its true self in layers of reality, like a nightmare that one still feared upon waking, despite the details of the dream being vague. Now, though, the beast had dropped the veil and allowed her to glimpse its true form. Nightmare was a tyrant. It was her enemy. Its whispered voice in her ear was like claws tearing into her brain. Sleep tight. Lilith drew in her breath to scream, to warn Zoraida. But Nightmare hurled her into the pit, stifling her pleas by turning them into a scream. Darkness closed in, smothered her, and pulled her down. Zoraida shuddered as she listened to Lilith's desperate cries. She then intoned the words of the spell to seal Nythera, and with the grinding of stone on stone, the pit began to close. When it was done, she turned and began to slowly shuffle toward the steps leading down from the tower. We must plan carefully now. Find Pandora. Try to bring the others to our side before Titania can recruit them to her own. She paused and then looked over her shoulder back toward the dreamer. Can you deliver a message for me? The dreamer grinned. This game just kept getting better and better.
that's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Join us next time for more Tales of Malathor.